Coming up, it's official. According to the Minister for Brexit Opportunities, Jacob Rees-Mogg, readers of The Sun and Express newspapers responded to his requests for suggestions of Brexit opportunities with over 2,000 ideas. Of these, Jacob Rich Snob and his team have selected the top nine ideas. And every one of them would be completely hilarious if they weren't primarily about removing rights for workers and consumers or removing protections for the environment. Stay tuned. The only funding I receive to produce these videos is through YouTube ads and super thanks donations. And every penny helps fund my research. But if you want to help me grow this channel, all I'm asking for you to do is hit the like and subscribe buttons and click that little notification bell to be reminded of new videos every Saturday. So, these top nine populist ideas are all of the cut off your head to save on haircuts variety. But let's do a proper grown up factual analysis of each one of them in turn. Number one, encourage fracking by shortcutting the rules on planning consultation via an emergency act of parliament. In other words, allow fracking companies to avoid scrutiny on their fracking operations. Operations which are known to carry threats of earthquakes and contamination of drinking water and waterways. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there are people in Britain who do think the current fracking restrictions are too harsh, though not me, I must say. But the point is this. These are not EU regulations. EU member countries all have their own separate sovereign rules on fracking. In fact, even the countries currently making up the UK have their own regulations. Fracking is illegal in Scotland, but not in England, for example. This fracking item is number one on the list of Brexit opportunities. Yet it is clearly not a Brexit opportunity. It has nothing at all to do with the EU. But let me just remind you right now, every single one of those Leave voters that I've spoken to knew exactly what they were voting for. Number two, abolish the EU regulations that restrict vacuum cleaner power to 1400 watts. Now, just a quick but serious reminder here. This is the runner up best Brexit opportunity, apparently, out of the 2000 potential Brexit opportunities suggested to Jacob Rees Smug by the great British public. The life destroying problem of someone who has bought a slightly underpowered vacuum cleaner. And as most vacuum cleaners sold in the UK seem to be around the 900 watt level from my research, it would appear that the 1400 watt limit really isn't relevant for most vacuum cleaners or for most people. Also, according to the experts, the rated wattage of a vacuum cleaner doesn't necessarily relate to the amount of suction power it generates. In fact, how much dirt and dust gets removed by the machine is more to do with the efficiency of the motor and the design of the head. With a larger wattage, you can use brute force to increase suction, but this would only be needed if you had an inefficient motor, and in other words, a pretty crap vacuum cleaner. So by abolishing this regulation, you'd be paving the way for British manufacturers to be making inefficient crap vacuum cleaners that would cost British consumers more through their electricity bills. Why do I say British consumers? Well, because in order to export their machines, the British manufacturer will still have to comply to a 1400 watt limit regulation in overseas markets, both in the EU and elsewhere in the world. And if you think that foreign manufacturers are going to develop new, higher wattage, inefficient vacuum cleaners specifically for the British market, then I've got a unicorn to sell you. Number three remove precautionary principal restrictions, for instance, on early use of experimental treatments for seriously ill patients and GM crops. OK, let's start with those experimental treatments. The European Medicines Agency is set up so that all the regulatory authorities across Europe audit each other. So that way, standards are applied consistently across the continent to protect the lives and the health of those patients undergoing experimental treatments. Now, what's interesting is that the MHRA, the 
body in Britain that's responsible for these standards, is also responsible for 40% of these European audits because the UK was held in such high regard as an upholder of standards, ethics and protections. It seems that Jacob Rich Snob and his merry band of Brexiteers seem to want to ditch that reputation in the eyes of the world for their own nefarious purposes. Quite what those purposes are in terms of removing these particular protections, I, I can't even begin to guess. And GM crops not being restricted? Well, I guess your Monsantos and your global agribusiness corporations might claim that they no longer have to worry about the long-term effects of their genetically modified crops on the health and lives of consumers, and it may allow them to tighten their restrictions on what seed and insecticides farmers are allowed to access. But I can see no way in which this third highest ranked Brexit opportunity is indeed an opportunity for anyone other than the global corporations looking to reduce the control, safeguarding and monitoring of their activities. Number four, abolish rules around the size of vans that need an operator's license. So not an area where I have much knowledge, I must admit, but having researched this, I've discovered that this is an area of EU regulation designed for health and safety protection of drivers and the general public. Currently, if operators use a van weighing over three and a half tonnes, they need an operator's licence, which compels them to limit a driver's working day to 10 hours, as well as ensuring that the van is serviced regularly and is road legal regarding tyres, exhaust fumes and so on. By abolishing these rules, these checks go out of the window, allowing employers to force drivers to work more than 10 hours a day in potentially unserviced, polluting and unroadworthy vans. I mean, exactly whose interests would be served by this? Certainly not the van driver, other road users or pedestrians, that's for sure. It would definitely lead to more road casualties for the NHS to deal with and have an impact on air quality affecting all of us. Not only that, but in May, the EU reduced the limit on the size of vans requiring operators' licences to two and a half tonnes. So any van larger than that from Britain travelling to the continent or even across the Irish border would be subject to EU regulations regarding an operator's licence. So nothing will change for those operators whose vans go to the continent or the Republic of Ireland. So for those companies, Abolishing the rules in the UK is irrelevant as they will still need to adhere to EU health and safety regulations. And a good job too, if you ask me. Or if you ask anyone with any knowledge at all of operators' licences, anyone with experience of driving, or anyone who knows anything about air quality near roads. These rules are there to protect all of us, not just van drivers. The only people who will benefit short term are any unethical companies operating van fleets who will save costs and boost profits at the expense of their drivers and the general public. Number five, abolish EU limits on electrical power levels of electrically assisted pedal cycles. Okay, now this is an area I have personal experience of. We have a 250 watt limit for pedelex as they're called, pedal electric bikes when they're used on public roads. Now, I'm familiar with this because I myself had a KTM Pedelec for many years. The assistance from the motor is limited to up to 15 and a half miles an hour and is delivered proportionately to the pedal power the rider is providing. So as a result, the motor tends to kick in when you're going uphill or against a headwind and keeps a pedelec roughly equivalent to a normal bicycle as a health and safety risk to both rider and the general public. Now, bear in mind that these machines are bicycle frames mounted on bicycle wheels with bicycle inner tubes, bicycle brakes and bicycle tires. They're not designed for particularly high speeds. Nothing is stopping you from having a more powerful electric bike, but you're gonna want motorbike wheels, motorbike frame, motorbike brakes, motorbike tires, and you're also, by the way, going to need a motorbike license, which all seems eminently sensible to me. Why would you want to abolish these requirements just to have any unskilled, inexperienced rider let loose on an electric bike traveling at up to 70 miles per hour? But that is what is proposed as a wonderful Brexit opportunity that was the fifth best idea out of 2,000 wacky ideas. Oh, and by the way, the UK regulations are actually currently even stricter than the EU regulations in any case. 
In the EU, you can be any age to ride a pedelec. In the UK, you have to be at least 14 years old. So this nonsense about a bonfire of EU red tape, this one would be more a bonfire of British red tape and sod all to do with the EU or Brexit yet again. Number six, allow certain medical professionals such as pharmacists and paramedics to qualify in three years. I mean, what? What are they thinking? Again, that phrase comes back to mind, doesn't it? We've had enough of experts. The US, India, China, Australia, every single one of our allies, the Bank of England, the IFS, the IMF, the CBI, five former NATO Secretary Generals, the Chief Exec of the NHS, and most of the leaders of the trade unions in Britain all say that you, Boris, and Nigel are wrong. Why should the public trust you over them? I think the people in this country have had enough of experts with uh, organisations experts. from acronyms the people of this saying, country have had saying, enough of experts. Ha, with, with, from organisations with acronyms saying that they know what is best and the getting it consistently wrong. This because these people, these people are the same ones who've got consistently wrong. This is proper What's Trump politics, isn't it? Would you trust Michael Gove instead of experts? Would you trust Jacob Rich Snob when he says certain medical professionals should be allowed to qualify in three years? Basic medical training is actually defined by the UK's Medical Act of 1983 and specifies the exact areas of expertise which are to be taught within a professional medical training program. By shortening the length of training, you're making medical professionals less expert. So is that what Leave voters wanted Brexit for? to make medical professionals less expert, less competent. Remember again, every Leave voter that I've spoken to says they know exactly what they voted for, so this is on them. And remember as well that this is one of the top nine Brexit opportunities they've identified. All I can think is that with this so-called opportunity that would benefit precisely nobody, just put lives and public health at risk, is that the Brexiteers are trying to destroy compliance with basic EU standards in this and many other areas just as a way of diverging from EU standards, just for the hell of it to make rejoining the EU that much more complicated when it eventually happens. Number seven, remove requirements for agency workers to have all the attributes of a permanent employee. Now this one is straight from the Tory party playbook of moving us all towards the gig economy of zero hours contracts and zero employment rights. In whose interests would it be to remove employment rights from agency workers? Certainly not the agency workers themselves, that's for sure. And in no way at all would it benefit directly employed workers. It would just incentivise their employers to move them onto agency contracts. It would be an opportunity for unethical employers to trouser the cost savings of being able to restrict employment benefits mandated by law to direct employees only, leaving agency workers worse off and the unethical employers with an extra bulge in their trouser pocket. Number eight, simplify the calculation of holiday pay, 12.07% of pay, to make it easier for businesses to operate. Haven't these people heard of calculators? And what phone these days doesn't have a basic calculator app? When these people hear about computers, it's going to blow their tiny little Brexiteer minds. Although we do know that Jacob Rees Smug doesn't have a computer on his desk, as we saw in the recent self-publicity images he's released, boasting about the lack of technology on his desk. Something I would have thought for a cabinet minister to be embarrassed about, not proud of in the 21st century, wouldn't you think? But what this so-called opportunity seems to really be about is to reduce or abolish holiday pay per se. You see, the principle of this regulation is that if you work regular overtime for which you're paid and you take a holiday, you shouldn't lose out as a result of taking a holiday by having holiday pay solely based on basic pay. So what you do is you calculate your average pay over a period to come out with the fair amount of holiday pay you should earn. This has been ruled on in the British courts and is now an established part of British case law. I reckon this is actually all about trying to get rid of fair holiday pay calculations altogether so that holiday pay doesn't reflect regular overtime pay. Workers would lose out and only the employers would benefit by trousering this cost and boosting profits for the bosses. It makes you wonder whose side the Tories are on if you hadn't already thought about it for at least five seconds. 
Number nine, reduce requirements for businesses to conduct fixed wire testing and portable appliance testing. In other words, less electrical safety testing in the workplace of both portable and fixed appliances. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, apart from the threat to public and employee safety and the danger of death, that is. But in any case, fixed wire testing and portable appliance testing are not EU regulations anyway. They were introduced as part of the United Kingdom's Electricity at Work Regulations 1989 and gives companies themselves the ability to write their own testing protocols, specifying how frequently they need to carry out electrical testing of portable and fixed electrical appliances. Electrical testing standards in this country are covered by BS 7671. If you didn't already know, BS stands for British Standard. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the EU or Brexit. And it gets worse. This very week, there was an article in the professional journal Engineering and Technology, written by Connor McClone, with the headline, Exposed, the National Wiring Scandal Putting Lives at Risk. And the article puts forward evidence that flaws in the current regulatory system are increasing the risk of fires as businesses cut costs to boost profits at the expense of public safety. Now, I know that this current cabal in Westminster have had enough of experts, but the electrical experts themselves are saying that far from reducing requirements for electrical testing, this country should be strengthening them to protect the public and employees. It's bad enough as it is right now, but any so-called Brexit bonus reduction of testing requirements will not lead to a bonfire of red tape but an altogether different type of fires, causing many injuries for the NHS to deal with and leading to the loss of lives. Look, these nine so-called Brexit opportunities are mainly not to do with Brexit, as nearly all of them relate to British law, not EU law. But each and every one of them seem to be like a wet dream of this dogmatic, UKIP-like, Tory cabinet's blinkered desire for what they like to call small government. In other words, no regulations governing the health, safety and protection of consumers, workers, patients, the public or our environment. Putting profit and corporations before people, that seems to be the Brexit they want to see. I had an idea that each one of these nine ideas sounded batshit crazy. And after just a few hours of research, I've discovered the facts that I've presented in this video, which proves that each so-called Brexit opportunity is nothing of the sort. Now, if I can prove this after just a few hours research, the conclusion must be that either Jacob Rees-Mogg is incredibly stupid or that this list is just another facet of the web of lies, deceit and dishonesty spun by the swivel-eyed Brexiteers who have currently and as increasingly seems likely temporarily hijacked our national government.